presentation on uh, <clears throat> Invest in Our Recovery, presented by Raise Up Massachusetts as it's part of our Fund Healthcare Not Warfare series. As you are all aware, <clears throat> COVID-19 is not only a healthcare crisis, it is also an economic crisis. And it's an economic crisis for the state of Massachusetts and all states and towns who have to continue providing their services and have to provide more services than they used to have to provide in many cases. And yet the employment, there's a lot of people unemployed and tax revenue is down. So the state is looking at a substantial budget shortfall and it's trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, our speakers tonight are Enid Eckstein and James Wu. They're representative of Raise Up Massachusetts. Raise Up Massachusetts is the grassroots economic justice coalition in Massachusetts. Uh, Mass Peace Action has been a member of it since the beginning or close to the beginning. That is the coalition that has raised the minimum wage in our state from what, $7 to $15. It has um, passed family, paid family and medical leave. And it has been working long and hard to pass the fair share amendment or millionaire's tax, which will allow those who can afford to pay, pay their fair share towards the state's expenses. Uh, and now <clears throat> Raise Up has reformulated its um, plans in the context of the COVID economic crisis. And that campaign is called Invest in Our Recovery. Uh, so now I will turn it over to Enid and James, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Cole. Um, so with that being said, I'm just gonna get right into it. Hi everyone, my name is James Wu. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I've been working with Raise Up for about three years now um, and I'll let Enid introduce herself. Sorry, I didn't know you were turning over to me right in the beginning. <laughs> Hi, I'm Enid Eckstein. I think I know some of you on the screen. Um, I used to work for the Service Employees Union for many years and was one of the organizations very involved in creating uh, Raise Up and since then have been involved in Raise Up as part of uh, Progressive Mass and really feel like Raise Up is a major grassroots organization of many organizations really seeking economic justice for working families. James? Cool. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. I am now a co-host, so I have that power. Um, we have just um, a little PowerPoint to help walk us through the presentation tonight. Um, and we'll also be sharing this with Cole and you can share it with everyone else after the fact. Um, so yeah, like Cole said, we are um, Raise Up Massachusetts. We're here to talk a little bit about our latest campaign, um, the Invest in Our Recovery campaign, trying to pass corporate taxes to help um, increase state revenue and use that revenue towards things like public education, transportation, and a lot of other programs that have been facing a lot of budget cuts due to the pandemic. Um, so I think just, I would love to have everyone quickly introduce themselves in a chat box, just like your name, pronouns, um, any organizational affiliation you might have, um, just so we can all get a chance to know each other. And then we'll walk through the agenda very quickly. While folks are doing that, we'll um, just keep going. So for today's presentation, we have roughly four sections planned, which is this introduction section where we like talk about kind of why we wanted to do this campaign, why this presentation exists, um, talking a little bit about the moment that we're currently in and kind of getting us all thinking about what's been happening in our communities, our state, and in the country, looking towards the past at any past recessions Massachusetts has faced, and then looking towards the future at the Invest in Our Recovery campaign. Cool. Thank you everyone for putting your 
names in the chats. I am seeing people from all over the state. So that's really cool. Um, so for today's presentation, um, we have a couple of goals that we're hoping to just keep in mind as we um, continue forward with the slides. One is gaining clarity and understanding about the present moment, looking at our vision for Massachusetts in its recovery, um, how we can do our part and invest in recovery, like what is this campaign? How is it going to help? And also at how you as individual activists can join the fight on the statewide level and help advocate. Um, so like Cole said, we're um, a grassroots coalition that's committed to building an economy that works for all of us. One, an economy that invests in our families, gives everyone the opportunity to succeed and creates broadly shared prosperity. Um, we've been around for, I think this is year number seven and Cole laid out some of our past campaigns, so I um, won't go into detail, but needless to say, we are very excited that we're launching this Invest in Our Recovery campaign and also emergency paid sick time. I'm going to kick it over to Enid to talk a little bit, of, a little bit about the national picture before we get into what it looks like on the state level. Enid, you're on mute. <laughs> I try to have good habits of keeping myself on mute. Um, so we thought it would be good just to start with like the national picture. And as peace activists, obviously a diagram like this is very familiar to you that, you know, basically, you know, half spending is military spending. And we all want to impact that because if we spent less money on military, we'd be able to have many, many more dollars for healthcare and some of the other programs. And, you know, obviously that would trickle down to the states. But um, I think it's important for purposes of this discussion that we can't, that obviously we all hope there's a better outcome in the election, but what Raise Up is working on is state problems. But we're mindful given also what's happening with the stimulus and um, the lack of action in DC that it uh, Im impacts what we do here. But for purposes of tonight's discussion and Raise Up, what we're gonna talk about is what's really happening in Massachusetts. And, but I just felt like that was important that's something we should always be keeping in mind that not only that our national priorities are screwed up for that lack of a better term and that, you know, we see so much money going into the military. And, you know, the, just like in Massachusetts, there are things we'd want to change also in terms of state funding, like less money for jails, less money for any of a number of other programs. But that's not the question in front of us for Race Up right now. James? Thanks, Amy. Um, so... I think this slide is um, something kind of more interactive that we like to just get our presentation started off with. Um, this is a pretty small group, so I'm hoping we can just have like a large group discussion slash chat discussion. Um, we love to just ask, what are some of the things that you've been seeing happen in your communities in the state um, or federally? And if you want to just put that in the chat or take yourself off of mute and share, we'd love to just hear what's been happening across the state. And what, what do people see happening in Massachusetts? Six billion shortfall in the state budget, right? So that every single sector of the state economy, <laughs> from transit to, to education, health care, public public health, social services, everything is. Uh, mm -hmm. And what like specific service, like for other people, are there specific services or specific concerns you have, like around? you know, how the virus has played out or housing or whatever. I'm just kind of curious from people's different vantage point here. State, uh, over 20% of small businesses have closed and over 40% of minority businesses have mm -hmm. closed. Mm -hmm. 
we are uh, with the expiration of the uh, rent and mortgage moratorium on October 17th, and without the passage of the pending bill in the uh, legislature to extend that for over a year, we're facing a probable avalanche of uh, evictions and foreclosures. Um, I'm gonna lift up some things that people have been putting in the chat box here. Um, we're heading for a second lockdown, but not just in Massachusetts, probably across the entire nation. Um, not, in, not sufficient money for education to protect teachers and students. Definitely a really big part of the conversation now that we're looking at schools reopening and the school year starting again. Um, Mary Ellen City had huge mental health substance abuse crises existing before COVID. And I really love that you brought that up because that's definitely something that all of these problems that we're seeing right now, mental health issues, substance abuse, um, substance abuse issues, um, kind of looking at the housing crisis, all of these have been existing before COVID was a thing. And the pandemic has really only brought all of these things into the forefront, into the light, and also made them worse at the same time. Al mentions the loss of homeless housing, increase in opioid use, um, Governor Baker ignoring the need to prevent evictions after October 17th when the moratorium is set to expire. Cool. Um, thank you everyone for sharing um, this next slide. We have just some specific statistics, um, if you will, that we wanted to lift up during tonight's presentation. And a lot of these um, are things that have been issues before, but like I said, this pandemic has only brought them into light and made them a lot worse. Um, starting with systemic racism, Hispanic residents are 12% of the population, but 30% of positive COVID cases and Black residents 7% of the population, and yet they're 14% of positive COVID cases. Um, the um, unemployment rate, Massachusetts has one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. At one point, it was the highest unemployment rate in the country. Like a lot of folks have lifted up, housing has been a big problem. One in three renters in Massachusetts are at risk of eviction. And the eviction moratorium expires October 17th with no legislation that has extended it. Um, so that's definitely a big cause of concern right now. Lots of um, complaints of unsafe workplace conditions made to the attorney general's office. Um, I think like someone lifted up, education has also been a big thing that's um, in the conversation right now. A lot of educators have been laid off. Um, a lot of unsafe school reopening conditions across the state and country, stressors of kind of this mixed in-person and remote teaching. And I, th and I think Enid had brought this up earlier, but while all of this is going on, the federal government is still doing nothing to help. There's still been no stimulus package passed to help states recover. And yet they're still funding things like the military at massive levels and have not thought to redirect some of that budget to help states. Um, so I'm gonna kick it to Enid to talk mm -hmm. about the current state um, kind of more in regards to revenue in Massachusetts. So um, before we get to the actual, you know, decrease in, you know, the actual shortfall, let's talk about what's really happened in terms of a decrease in tax revenue. So uh, we've had high unemployment, which means less revenue comes from income tax. Uh, it's been a little bit softened by the fact that people um, got high unemployment uh, payments from the federal and a little bit from the state um, and the stimulus. But regardless, uh, less revenue is coming in from income. Uh, legislature has been cutting budgets for crucial programs and many other sources of revenue beyond um, you know, taxes from employment, uh, the gas tax, less people driving. I know I've driven my car very little the last six months. Hotel tax, which you know, certainly a lot of our cities really rely on, especially Boston, has really, really um, you know, taken a hit. 
So, um, you know, it really depends um, on whose numbers you believe. And, but, you know, we're looking between, you know, the latest estimates are approximately a $5 billion, $6 billion revenue shortfall for the upcoming, year, upcoming fiscal year. We know that on the 7th of October, the legislature will be bringing in uh, a number of, um, you know, fiscal experts that will talk about what they anticipate to be uh, the number, the actual number of revenue shortfall. But we know that we're short money. Um, you know, it's like, don't have any allowance coming in. Your pockets are empty. Next slide. And so, you know, when we look at Massachusetts, and this is something that, you know, um, raise up and others have been working on. We do not have a fair tax structure in Massachusetts. Basically, um, what we call our taxes really are in some ways upside down, um, in which lower income people pay the highest proportion of their income and in taxes, and the most affluent contribute the smallest share of their income. Huh? Like this is what we're talking about, economic inequality. And part of the reason that Mass rely, Massachusetts relies a lot on consumption taxes like gas and user fees for revenue is that um, higher income people stash a lot of their income back into their own wealth, uh, whereas poor people have to spend all of, you know, spend most of their income on user fees and other taxes. So the only way we can have progressive taxes is by directly uh, taxing income, wealth, or business profits, which we'll get into in a few minutes. But, you know, and our other issue is, as uh, Cole mentioned, that Raise Up has been, uh, you know, fighting mightily to get the um, fair share amendment on the ballot, which we anticipate will be on the ballot in 2022. Uh, Massachusetts, we, it is illegal for us to have, it is unconstitutional to have a graduated income tax. So the attempt to uh, basically change our structure will be to tax the highest level of, of um, income earners, those over a million dollars, and then to look at corporate taxes and other closing other corporate loopholes. Next slide. And, um, you know, a lot of people, like I've lived in Massachusetts, I'd say how many people, you know, I have to put your hands up. I've lived in Massachusetts for 35 years. And there was always the joke, Massachusetts is tax Massachusetts. Well, we really are not tax Massachusetts at all. Uh, business taxes in Massachusetts um, really, um, are a smaller share of the private sector economy than in most states. And if you look at the orange line in the middle, um, that's overall and 4.5% and Massachusetts, we're lower. So we are on the low end of um, taxing our business sector. Um, despite what the myths are, despite what Charlie Baker wants you to believe, that is what the reality is. And um, so, you know, in any pandemic, a lot of people make out, and which is totally unfair. We have some people who are making extraordinary profits. Uh, Facebook, Johnson & Johnson, that's probably sitting on maybe a potential uh, vaccine. Microsoft, Pfizer, Oracle, Verizon, Visa. Um, we can all you know, list a number of companies, but 17 out of America's top 25 corporations made extraordinary profits during this pandemic. Um, and that in Massachusetts, 19 billionaires saw their wealth increase by a total of 17 billion during just the first three months of the pandemic. So when Raise Up is talking about investing in our recovery, it is really about, um, we need to be looking at how do we make profitable corporations and their wealthy shareholders pay uh, to support our economic recovery. Economic recovery cannot be on the backs of working families, of you know, people who um, you know, are bar barely making it and being able to put uh, food on their table. So uh, this is what we're talking about is really trying to do um, with some tweaks, which we'll get to around the corporate taxes. We're looking at how can we do some income redistribution and really make uh, corporation, you know, taxing corporate profits to pay their fair share. Is that me still? Sorry. Oh, no, I think this is me now. <laughs> um, so I think like Enid had very clearly laid out, our tax system is completely upside down. This pandemic has not made anything better. It's only made it worse. So clearly things just aren't working and we need something more. Um, we need more in the budget. We need more funding. We need more revenue. So before we kind of look into what we 
um, are aiming to accomplish with this campaign, we're going to take a look at the past, actually, just to look at some things that has happened in the past three decades, past 30 years only. Um, in the past three decades, Massachusetts has faced three, recess three recessions already. Um, and based on these recessions, we can learn several things, um, not only in Massachusetts, but also nationwide, where state revenue goes down because tax revenue, tax revenue go da goes down, um, that is caused by unemployment, things like the gas tax and hotel tax are down right now. Um, and after the state revenue goes down, the legislature takes a look at the budget shortfall they're facing and decides to raise taxes. All three past recessions that we're talking about right now, the legislature has decided to raise taxes. So it's not something new and it's not something that they're like a stranger to. And because of this, because the legislature has decided to raise taxes, this creates opportunities for social change. And that's where we come in, we can kind of influence those taxes, those decisions made by lawmakers to create social change, to keep things um, moving forward and improving and not just returning to the old status quo. So, these are the three recessions that I mentioned on the previous slide. First one was 1990 to 1991. During this recession, the legislature raised the personal income tax, increased the capital gains tax and other unearned income. Both of these are taxes on wealth and also taxes on income, especially this increasing the capital gains tax and other unearned income. That is a corporate tax that we'll also be talking about later, just to give folks a little preview. Um, in 2001 and 2002, um, the legislature increased the capital gains tax again and also increased other excise taxes, for example, tax on cigarettes. Um, and the very recent recession in 2009 and 2010, the legislature increased the sales tax rate and also increase some other um, corporate taxes that are not listed on this slide. However, Mass Budget has a really great paper on this if you are very interested. Um, so where does this bring us now? We're kind of in that stage, if you think back to the three things that happened in past recessions, we're in the state revenue has gone down and we're now at the junction where the legislature can either decide to raise taxes like they have done in the past or they can keep waiting and dragging their feet and hoping that the federal government will act and give us stimulus package money. We can't wait that long. Schools, transportation, other programs in Massachusetts can't wait that long. So we have to just act now and make the legislature choose to raise taxes in a progressive manner and invest in how Massachusetts as a state recovers from COVID. And I'm going to hand it over to Ina to talk a little bit more about kind of the future. So, um, you know, I, I, I kind of joke that um, the legislature is sort of in a year of um, magical thinking. They really, really want something to happen from, from the federal government because they don't want to take a vote about taxes, uh, et cetera, but that's not how the world works. So when uh, we talk about progressive revenue, so what are really our values? What are we talking about? We're talking about that they should be fair, that they should be sustainable, um, that we don't want like, you know, something to happen tomorrow. We need to have a long-term fix here and then adequate to basically fund um, you know, programs um, and make sure that we don't have cuts, that we do not want to see our state go to austerity spending. And that you know, if you look at, for example, the Student Opportunity Act, that was passed um, last year um, to fix something that was totally wrong with education funding and needed to be fixed for like 25 years. And finally we get it funded and it's fixed and now um, the legislature, you know, is looking at how to fund it. So, and they might be making cuts. So we are not interested in austerity. We are interested in being able to fund 
the programs that all of you mentioned in the beginning in the chat. So, next slide. And, you know, we did a poll and we did several polls over the, um, the course of the winter and then the spring. This poll was actually done in, in July. And even though it's a little difficult to read, I think what you need to look at, look at is the blue and the yellow together, um, which is somewhat favor and strongly favor. But Massachusetts voters overwhelmingly support raising taxes on profitable corporations, whether it's closing loopholes, whether it's adding an additional tax on annual income, which we'll talk about, or whether it's taxing corporate profits or going after um, unearned income or closing other corporate loopholes. So it's very important to know that, there, that wh whatever the legislature thinks and whatever the legislators choose to do or not, that there is public support to make sure that corporations pay their fair share. And this was done, um, so this is very recent poll. So what, are, what is Raise Up proposing? So I'm gonna go through three options and then we um, actually have a fact sheet that we can put in the chat at the end. Um, they're, they're a little technical and I am not a text expert, but I feel like in talking about this, um, what I'm gonna try to do is make it understandable to people. So the first is increasing the tax rate on corporate profits. And what's important to know is that pre-2009, uh, you know, the last recession, uh, we had a rate of 9.5% um, on corporate profits, and then it was cut to 8%. So what we're looking at is we want to return it to that rate. Um, and, um, you know, like most states, Massachusetts does tax corporate profits. So we're talking about profits. We're not talking about a business that's not making it, making it. We're talking about, you know, the ones that, that you, know, you know, at the end of the year, they have a profit. So it's the tax on profit. Um, and this is especially important uh, given the state's fiscal crisis. And so um, we've worked really closely with Mass Budget and other fiscal experts. And, um, you know, it's hard to know exactly how much money that would add, but it's predicted that it could raise approximately $500 million annually, um, which, um, you know, and it, and, you know, assuming we actually could get something like this passed, then we would have a much better sense of how much money it actually earns. But this is based upon the economic analysis. So increasing the tax on corporate profits is the first one. The second part is guilty. Guilty as charged is what I like to say. And this is a mouthful. Um, global intangible low taxed income, better known as guilty. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about guilty, what guilty is, because I just think it's important. Um, and who knows how they came up and uh, came up with this name, but it was a way of identifying and taxing some of the profits that multinational corporations try to hide offshore. And, you know, this has, uh, uh, of course, it has a Trump uh, fingerprint on it because after Trump was elected, he and the majority of Congress wanted to pass um, the huge tax cut for corporations and the wealthy. And the tax codes were going to increase the federal deficit so much that they needed some backstops on how much multinational corporations could avoid taxes. Um, and so they needed to do this because otherwise the projected deficit um, would be so large that different congressional rules would apply and they couldn't vote it through with just a small, minor, with a small majority. So guilty was one way to hold down the deficit. So if a multinational corporation was using accounting tricks, which we know they do, to hide its profits so that it was reporting most of its profits like in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands that don't charge corporate taxes and where the company had few business assets, then a portion of those assets were federally declared as guilty. Okay, get that so far? So they can declare part of their profits as guilty um, and half of that is taxable. And this was what the federal rule was. But in an obscure overnight rule, with no debate, Massachusetts legislature approved only taxing 10% of the guilty profit. So what we want to do is actually take that 10% and bring it in line with what all the other states are doing um, and making sure that it's paid at the federal level. Um, and Max Massachusetts should tax half of all guilty income, just like the federal government. So I don't know if people follow that. It is complicated. And some people have a cute little flower and palm tree showing the corporations running away to create a cartoon of that. But this is really about taxing offshore income. Next slide. And then lastly, 
We want to increase the tax rate that um, investors pay on unearned income. So unearned income is income from investments, other form of assets. Um, and right now, unearned income is currently taxed as the same rate as earned income, wages and salaries. So on the unearned income, basically, um, we're not talking about taxing pensions or um, 403B or 401K. We're talking about, you know, investor income from other forms of asset ownership. And um, there's a lot of discussion about what rate should that be taxed at, right? Um, so we've kind of kicked around some numbers and, you know, part of it is like based upon what's the financial analysis. Um, but um, right now it's paid at the current, um, each percentage, I'm just going to read this, each percentage point increase from the current tax rate of 5% would generate another 400 to 500 million annually. And guilty is um, projected at, um, just, just trying to find the number here. Um, but guilty is also projected as um, increasing, um, just find it, another approximately $400 million annually. So these, you know, these, all these are different pieces. Most of these are in the legislature now as different packages, as well as the fact that most of these can be done, like changing the corporate income tax could be done by a budget amendment. So these are not things that are totally out there in outer space. But these are things that actually the Progressive Caucus in the legislature is now discussing. Thank you, Enid, for taking us through the proposal. <laughs> that was a lot of tax speak. And like Enid said, we do have a fact sheet that will summarize this in um, not necessarily like very intense tax policy language. I'm also seeing some people in the chat. Um, we'll answer any like questions you might have at the end of this presentation. We just want to get through a couple more slides. Um, so now what I'm going to talk about is what are we looking forward? Like what does the timeline for the rest of this year look like? What does the timeline for this campaign look like? So right now we are in a really weird time when it comes to the legislature. We don't know a lot of concrete details, which to anyone who has done any kind of lobbying or advocacy work, that's not a surprise when it comes to Massachusetts legislature, but we can hypothesize based on what we've seen the legislature do um, this year. So in at the end of July, the legislature passed an interim budget through October. They didn't pass a full budget, they only passed um, a budget for a couple months, which means that budget discussions are beginning again in October right, right now. And there's potential legislative action on a budget in November. Um, most likely after the election is what we're thinking, although the legislature might decide to just completely go topsy-turvy and do something that none of us expect. So how does our campaign fit into this hypothesized legislative timeline? Um, so this very quick um, timeline just takes us from September until November. In September on Labor Day, Raise Up held a Labor Day rally in conjunction with the Greater Boston Labor Council. It's called Workers Rising and Raise Up also sent a letter to a legislature with over 160 organizations signed on in support of progressive revenue and in support of the Invest in Our Recovery campaign. So in October, this is when we predict budget discussions are going to start in the legislature where they start looking at what are they gonna do about this projected five to $6 billion shortfall that they're facing. And at the same time, Raise Up is launching our community briefings, which is where we um, gather a whole bunch of legislators, legislators from one particular region with their constituents and get them to pledge in support of the Invest in Our Recovery campaign, as well as emergency paid sick time. Um, so the first one was actually just a couple of days ago. It was at the North Shore on October 1st. The next one is um, upcoming Wednesday, I believe, um, in Boston on October 7th. 
these are all held over Zoom. They're not like in any physical location, but this upcoming one for Boston, um, we're looking at members of the Boston delegation so we can kind of ask them to support the Invest in Our Recovery campaign. If we look forward into November, November 3rd is the election day. Many, legislat many legislators are trying to wait for election results and wait for the federal government to take action um, when it comes to a stimulus package, when it comes to giving federal funding to states. Many legislators have stated that they're waiting to see what the feds will do. Um, and in November, we predict that the budget discussions will continue and keep happening. And there might be potential legislative action on the budget, I think after the election happens, but potentially before the week of Thanksgiving when no one does anything. So right now, Raise Up is in the process of our community briefings and that is our main campaign focus for this month. And that is one thing that we're asking all of you to join us in and help us with turnout. So there are some action steps that we have because we as Raise Up don't go anywhere without having a list of tactics and action steps that we want organizations and activists to help us out on. So the first thing is that organizational sign-on letter I had mentioned earlier. Although we sent a letter to a legislature already with over 160 organizations, we are still accepting sign-ons because the point of this letter um, was to just show the breadth and width and depth of our coalition, regardless of whether an organization has worked with Raise Up in the past or not, we are all united in this fight for progressive revenue and making the economy work for all of us. The second action step, joining Raise Up Grassroots Coalition meetings. I know that um, Mass Peace Action has been attending those grassroots um, meetings in the past, but this invite is open to any and all activists who care about the mission, care about the campaign and want to learn more. The next one is Tuesday, October 20th at 5 p.m. Um, also held over Zoom, they're all um, held over Zoom. And the last action step is joining the Boston Community Briefing that I mentioned earlier on October 7th. And there is a RSVP link where you can, where we'll um, put in the chat box later today, um, tonight as well. Um, so that if you wanna join, you can RSVP and we'll make sure you have the Zoom link and all the information you need to attend that community briefing. Beyond Boston, we have several more lined up for the rest of October. I don't have those dates and times at the top of my head, but I believe we have one for the Springfield area, one for the South Coast, um, New Bedford area, and I think one in Central Mass. Cool. So yeah, we have Worcester. I think we have a number of others in formation. And um, like the community briefings, um, in each of them, they're unique because we're trying to tie them to the local struggles. So the Boston one, which is on Wednesday night, we'll have somebody talking about the eviction moratorium. We'll have someone talking about the need for funding for transit, food insecurity, which is huge in Boston, um, as well as uh, education funding, uh, both higher ed and um, um, elementary through K-12. Um, and they're really aimed to basically be accounted. We're calling them community listening, but it's really about asking our delegation, in this case, the Boston delegation, to actually take a stand. We wanted them to pledge to uh, speak out against, uh, you know, to speak out against cuts and also to uh, basically sign on to pushing for revenue and asking the House and Senate leadership to take on this question of revenue and not just to sit there and wait till we have to have cuts. So here's a little bit more detail about the Boston Committee briefing, um, Wednesday, October 7th at 6.30 on Zoom. It's being co-hosted by Raise Up the Massachusetts Voter Table, JP Progressives, and Progressive Mass. And yeah, I think Ina gave a really great preview of what's to come on Wednesday. And somebody raised a question 
um, you know, I, this was like, why don't we just go to the next one just quickly. Oh, okay. And, you know, just to give an idea that we did this on um, Labor Day, when we were at the state house, we asked everybody to come forward and put the services that they wanted to protect. And you probably can't really see it, but obviously statewide, everything from the vineyard we're housing, um, and then Tucket, where housing and public health is a huge crisis to uh, the lack of rural transportation, mental health services, housing. I mean, all these are just different services that people really wanted to protect. And, um, you know, I think that the important thing here is none of these services can be protected without sufficient revenue. And, uh, you know, it's not like raise up stands for housing versus um, mental health services or public health. It's about the fact that we need to expand the revenue because we cannot really protect any of these services without sufficient revenue. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for joining the presentation today. Um, that's about it for our presentation. Mm -hmm. And just want to give a quick shout out to our friends and partners at Community Labor United and Mass Budget for helping supply a lot of the research and data points that were involved in this presentation. I just wanted to say one thing before we turn it over to questions. Um, you know, somebody, uh, Al Blake asked, what, what impact, if anything, does this have the bills currently in conference committee? And I wanna tell a cautionary tale because when the pandemic started, Raise Up introduced emergency paid sick time uh, as uh, an important piece of legislation because the federal government even though they gave extended sick time for people, there were a number of people who fell through the cracks and did not were not eligible for paid sick time, emergency paid sick time. And we got it through. We got, um, you know, I think like, you know, but 80% of the House and 80% of the Senate were co-sponsors and it languished and it languished. We did everything. We did hearings. We did, you know, costed it out for them. Finally gets reported out of committee and we still can't get a vote. So you know, I think we all have pieces of legislation that uh, we really need to be pushing the legislature. So we're hoping that in these accountability sessions, we're looking them with their constituencies. So that's why they're important. We want to get a lot of people on these calls to really push um, because, you know, whether it's criminal justice reform, you know, police reform, whether it's um, driver's license, there's like so many bills that are just stuck there because the legislature hasn't acted. So this is one of many things that we're everybody's collectively pushing. So we want to just take questions, discussion, Cole. Uh, yeah, let's see what's out here for discussion and questions. Um, so you can raise your hand uh, in the participants window. There's like a blue thing that says raise hand, or you can put something in the chat. Or you can try to go like this and we may see you depending <laughs> how many faces we can see at once. Okay, John, Jonathan has done both. So uh, I think he has a question or a comment. Jonathan. Uh, okay, first, thank you. Very clear, very helpful. Uh, points the way forward. This is the kind of thing we can get behind. You know, we have a, actually have a statewide network who's, who's experienced in lobbying state legislatures for state legislators around bills that uh, we, we never able to pass, but you may be able to pass this. Um, uh, so, I, you know, I think, you know, we, we will absolutely get behind it. Um, and also, uh, speaking of the Poor People's Campaign, I think we'll get behind it, uh, too. And they have a Western Massachusetts network that's quite, uh, quite distinctive. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, if all this does go through, so what fraction of the shortfall would it, would it cover? It's still, still not, you know, still going to leave some problems. Sorry, I'm going to answer that partly and then James can answer it. So, you know, when you, so when we're looking at the shortfall, I think we're looking at it over like really two, two and a half fiscal years. Um, and it's all compressed now because we didn't really have a budget. So we're kind of smushing. Smushing is like a very, very um, sophisticated word, but we're smushing it all together into a compressed time timeframe. Um, clearly, um, there's some people predict, and we don't really know, that the revenue shortfall, at least for the current fiscal year that we're com completing, was not as bad as anticipated, partly because of the federal government's aid. So we may be um, extending, I guess is the right word, past the smush, 
we might be extending into this, you know, fiscal 21 and 22. So, um, which gives us more time. Um, and, you know, our projections are based upon what we know today. They're not based upon the Department of Revenue doing a really hard analysis. I would say what we have projected here is not sufficient, but it takes a real, um, it takes the sting and gives us the ability to then be thinking forward, especially assuming that, um, you know, the, that ultimately the economy may be rebounding a little bit in the next year, as well as the fact that 2022, the fair share amendment goes on the ballot. Uh, and then 2023, 2023 yeah, and 24 is when it starts to go into effect. So not a really scientific answer because I don't think there's a really hard scientific answer. I don't know if you want to add, James. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to it is that being able to pass these specific tax policies right now will also give us a starting place to look right. at other right. forms of progressive okay. revenue in the future. Um, like Enid said, this shortfall isn't just going to be fixed by our campaign right now, and it's probably going to continue years into the future, and we'll be looking at various kinds of shortfalls to come. Um, so this gives us a starting place and gives us a way to keep moving forward and gives us also an opening into doing more forms of progressive revenue in the future as well. And yes, definitely the fair share amendment, which will give us $2 billion a year. That is a chunk. That's a very scientific term I used. <laughs> so, uh Along the same line, I was going to make a suggestion for the presentation that we have more of an overview of what the state budget is. Where does the income come from? Where are we spending it? Even in a normal year. And then I know that it's hard to make projections for this crazy year, but to the extent there are any projections for that, but it would be, you know, it would just give, just like you showed that pie of the federal budget, you could do the same for the state budget. I assume that... Um, mm -hmm people have that information that might help help people get oriented. Okay, Richard has a question. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, I uh, wanted to bring to the table uh, Mass Public Banking's effort to create a Massachusetts public bank and let you know that uh, in the next week or so, we will be asking for a meeting with uh, Raise Up Mass so that we can present our uh, mass public banking proposal to you in the hopes that uh, that uh, raise up sees fit to add it to the menu of legislation that it is uh, backing. Um, that if uh, mass public bank were created, uh, where this uh, will be uh, the second time we filed, we only had 25 co-sponsors this past year. Uh, we think we're positioned to advance a great deal in the next session. And uh, uh, we're going to propose a bill that uh, enables the state to do a lot of financing and infrastructure, uh, small business, fill all the holes that are missing in all of the current small business uh, financings, partner with community banks to strengthen them and do uh, participation loans with them, other things. To a certain extent, we're modeling off of the existing only public bank in the country, the Bank of North Dakota. Uh, um, Mike Conley in the House and Jamie Eldridge in the Senate are our lead sponsors. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, we're expanding the bill greatly in this next filing to deal with a lot of the pandemic uh, problems that our state is facing. I think the bill that we're going to come up with would be a bill that would fill approximately uh, um, 250 to 300 million of the shortfall every year. Uh, it basically brings the magic of fractional lending to the public, which is now reserved exclusively for private commercial banks. Uh, so at any rate, uh, you will be hearing from us shortly, and we hope you'll be willing to have a session with us to talk about public banking. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Edith or James, do you want to respond or? I don't really know much about it, so. 
Okay. Looks like you need that presentation. Richard yes. Is offering. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. uh, next up is Chris Horton from Worcester. Chris. Uh, you have to unmute. <clears throat> yes. Uh, I'm listening to this. This is a meeting of an organization of organizations, basically. Uh, and uh, the ear that I'm listening with is what do I bring back to constituency organizations as things to uh, act on and things that uh, people can uh, mobilize around. And uh, I'm sure it's here, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, in the PowerPoint, we had a slide that talked about some specific action steps that you can bring back. One of them was um, asking your organization to sign on to our letter, um, pledging support for the Invest in Our Recovery campaign, and also showing the legislature that um, the expanse of the coalition that supports this campaign, ranging from like labor unions to public health organizations, to community groups, to faith-based groups, um, just showing like how many people and organizations and causes all support raising progressive revenue. Um, some other things include joining the grassroots meetings to just keep updated with what's happening. Um, the next one I think is in a couple weeks, so there's a bit of time. And the last thing is attending one of these community briefings or talking to your legislature, um, legislator. So the upcoming community, community briefing we have is for the Boston delegation on Wednesday, October 7th. In addition to Boston, we'll have some more in Springfield, Worcester, um, Central Mass, South Coast, New Bedford area. Um, so they're happening across the state on a rolling basis throughout the month of October. We can send Cole um, the spreadsheet of the briefings. I just can't access it right this yeah. second. Um, but yeah. uh, number, <laughs> in, including one in Worcester, which I believe is up <clears throat> now. Oh. Yeah, and I will send all these resources out in an email to everyone who registered so okay. we can have that at our disposal and follow up. Uh, I have a question uh, for Ian and James. At what point do, do these proposals get written up as legislation or budget amendments or what have you and sort of enter the process where we actually um, call on legislators to to, to um, vote for them. So my understanding is they've all been introduced in one way or another, like the MTA filed a whole bunch of bills back in the fall. Um, but, you know, it's not like we're saying, you know, house blah, blah, or whatever. Um, we are hoping that um, there will be some package that like progressive legislators will be, you know, championing, 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 champion, whatever the word is, they'll be supporting. Um, and we'll make sure that, you know, I assume we'll be doing like we usually have, like the hub dialer, calling your legislator, email, et cetera. Um, you know, we've been waiting for the legislature to come back and actually act like a legislature, which uh, I think that on the 7th, they're gonna start having budget conversations. We anticipate, but we could be wrong that they might just take a quick vote on a budget for the end, at least to take them to mid-November. Because what we're hearing is none of them want to take a vote on taxes before election day. So, um, and they want to see what the federal government is doing. So I would say stay tuned. Um, we're more trying to do education now. Um, when Al, was it Al Horton? I'm sorry, I couldn't see, your, I can't see your name in the chat. Um, you know, Chris, 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 Chris I'm sorry. It's just covered it, for some reason. The, it, I can't read it. Um, you know, I feel like... Um, what we're trying to really do is educate, like, you know, James and I and other people at Raise Up have done a lot of these presentations. And, you know, it really is like trying to build grassroots support to recognize. So this is all about building infrastructure. And the fact that we got like 100, I think more like 170 organizations to sign on was really, you know, I think speaking to like a lot of grassroots organizing. Okay, anyone else? Oh, Jonathan, go ahead. Um, 
Uh, let me, oh, Lord. Um, first, of course, we were thrilled to see the pie chart, right? Normally nobody else in the whole, no organization anywhere in the United States, right, pr presents that. The federal government has never, over a hundred years of collecting income taxes, ever reported back to taxpayers how the money is spent. Um, and we fully understand that many, many, many organizations are focused on the state and therefore they say, well, we can't deal with the federal government. We actually believe that often it's not, they use that as an excuse because it's a hot potato to call for cutting Pentagon budget. So Peace Action is not a think tank, you know, it's 12,000 households, it's folks who used to get out the vote. We collected signatures to get okay. raised up on the ballot. We've worked in every phase of the campaign. But when we had bills before the state legislature, asking the state legislature to call, call upon the US Congress, um, you know, to cut the military budget, we couldn't get Raise Up or any other such organization to come and send somebody to testify. So I'm hoping that in the next round, right, it'll be a little more mutual. You know, we're gonna be there at these workshops and maybe when our hearing comes, calling on the, the getting, trying to push the state legislature to take a position on the federal government, even if it's symbolic, uh, um, that, that raise up will, will, will be there. Yeah, and just to put, bring in another dimension of that, uh, so Mass Peace Action does have a fund healthcare not warfare campaign. Over the years, we've had various campaigns that try to tie in the military budget to economic justice issues. We've had the people's budget, we've had the budget for all. So this year with the COVID crisis is fund healthcare not warfare. And lo and behold, the US Congress took a vote on fund healthcare not warfare in a sense in that there was a significant number of Democrats in the US Congress that proposed cutting 10% out of the federal, out of the military budget. So as Enid's uh, graph showed you, the current military budget is 750, 748 uh, billion dollars. So that 10% cut would have been 75 billion. And of course there were those in Congress that wanted to go much further, right? So Jim McGovern and Barbara Lee wanted to cut 350 billion but, but, the, but there was a vote in both chambers of Congress to cut uh, 75 billion and about half of the Democrats in both the House and the Senate voted for it, including Chuck Schumer, the minority leader of the Senate. So this thinking is now much closer to mainstream than it used to be. And uh, they can't deny that with that, that the terrible needs in the country for economic resources in the COVID crisis uh, is, is, is really out there. So uh, while our bills in the state legislature to, that, to get the state legislature to call in Washington to send more money may be symbolic, the votes in Congress are not symbolic and they are happening now and they will happen again next year. So that's just a, uh, a point. And to the attendees here tonight, we would welcome you to join our Fund Healthcare Not Warfare Committee, uh, Jonathan, or working group. Jonathan is the chair of it. It meets every two, every other Friday. When's the next meeting? I think we met. Oh, uh, well, we put it up because um, of the Columbus Day weekend. Our next forum is on the 18th. Forum, but when is the next committee meeting or working group meeting? Anyway, um, I see some new names on the on the uh, call tonight who who uh, who I'm not accustomed to seeing at Mass Peace Action events. So that we, we welcome you very much, and we'd love to work with you on the Invest in Our Recovery campaign, as well as when it comes around again in Congress from Healthcare Not Warfare to cut the military budget in, in Congress. So that's another way to get involved. Uh, let me uh, ask if there's anything else. Any other comments or questions? Otherwise, we will thank our speakers, Enid and James, very much for enlightening us with, with their uh, detailed presentation and, uh, and bid everyone a good night. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, if you all want to take a look at the chat right now real quick, I put in a link to our oh, yeah. um, three-page fact sheet that Enid was mentioning. Cole will also send this to you so you can send it out to the group. but. Yeah, yeah. to have that as Great. a resource for folks. Yeah.
Thank you, James. And if you want to pass over those uh, slides or the uh, schedule of yeah. upcoming briefings and all of that, I will share it with yeah, everyone. I'll send you the schedule. We would reuse some of your slides because we have a for we have a webinar every two weeks on you know fund healthcare not warfare. Sometimes we get some some big audiences, mm -hmm. uh, and we would re, we we put out there. This is an ongoing campaign that you know we're getting behind. Great. <laughs> Okay, Bye. thank you everyone, good night. Good night.